Hey there, Mr. Mario here. In this video, we are discussing Newton's first law of motion, which is also referred to as the law of inertia, a word we'll define here in a few minutes. Um, basically, what we want to be able to do today is answer two questions. Why do things move the way that they do? And then how do we describe motion to begin with? And then secondly, how do we analyze the forces acting on a moving object, or not moving object, for that matter? So, let's start with the basics, describing motion. Things are moving, or in motion, when their position is changing with respect to time. So, if something is in one position, and then a few seconds later is in another position, we say it has moved. Um, position we can symbolize with the symbols X, Y, or Z, depending on which direction we're moving. We're going to start out simply moving in um, left or right directions, which will be x, or up and down, which will be y. And we can measure position in any unit of um, length or distance. Typically, we'll use meters. And then time will symbolize with lowercase t, and typically we will measure that in seconds, although we could also use minutes and hours and days and things like that. So here's one way that we can describe or represent motion, is that's with a motion diagram. Here we have an object at time zero seconds, and then after one second it's here, after two seconds it's here, and then after three seconds it is here. So since it's moved from a position of two meters to five meters to eight meters to eleven meters, we can say that it is in motion. The thing to notice is that during each one second interval, the object moves three meters. From two to five is three meters from 5 to 8 is 3 meters, and then from 8 to 11 is 3 meters. So to kind of put a number with that, we can say that it's moved 3 meters per each second. It's one way to describe motion, and a picture like this is one way to represent motion. Another way to represent motion is by graphing the position of an object as a function of time. So on the x-axis of this graph, we have time, t, and on the y-axis, we have position, which is x. And basically, I've plotted the position as a function of time from the last example. Um, one thing we could do with something like this is draw a line to extrapolate positions we may have not directly measured. And then we can kind of figure out the slope of this line. Like in this particular case, it moves up 3 meters, forward 3 meters, in one second. And we could get that same description of moving 3 meters every 1 second, or 3 meters per second. That quantity, meters per second, has a fancy physics name. It's called velocity. Um, to put a definition to that, velocity is the rate of change of position with respect to time. So keyword here is rate. And I can write that like change in position over change in time. If you're not familiar with the notation delta, so that triangle symbol is, the Greek letter delta, it simply means change in. So in my example, the position has changed three meters per every one second. Which gives us a velocity of three meters per second. I can also describe the object in terms of its initial position, as in where it started at. Um, and we can give that the symbol x with the subscript 0. You may say x naught for short. And then those two pieces of information are all I need in order to write an equation to describe the motion of the object. And the equation we're going to write is just y equals mx plus b, only instead of y, put whatever symbol for position we're using, in this case an x. Instead of the slope, write v, because that's what the slope is. Instead of x, write t, because that's what we graphed on the x-axis. And then plus whatever your y-intercept is. In this case, we call that the initial position. So the equation of motion for this object would be x equals 3 meters per second t plus 2 meters. So if we can graph the motion of an object, then we can write an equation to describe the motion and those three representations are kind of sort of all we need to describe how something is moving. Either a picture like we drew before, or a graph, or an equation. So, the thing about motion is that it's relative. 
depends on the observer. Who's observing the object will decide if it's moving or not, and if so, how fast it is. Um, different observers will view the motion of an object in different ways. Probably the best way to understand that is with the picture. Here's you and your little red wagon. Here's your buddy standing on the sidewalk wishing he had a little red wagon. Here's a fancy blue box in your little red wagon, and this is the picture at time t equals zero seconds. A second later, you're over here, but your buddy is still standing in place because he doesn't have a little red wagon. You would not observe that blue box to have moved because its position has not changed relative to you. It's still behind you in the wagon. And so you would say that the box didn't move. Whereas your buddy would observe a position change for the box. Before it was to one side of him, a second later it's on the other. So he would say that the box has moved. And so it's important to understand that motion is not going to look the same from all points of view. However, the rules for explaining motion do have to be the same from all points of view. And that's kind of something important to keep in mind, especially when um, physics type questions start to get tricky. So let's see if we can explain why objects move the way that they do. Things that move with a constant velocity, which is all we're going to worry about here at the beginning of the year. If the forces on an object are balanced, it's kind of an important word here, then the motion of the object will not change. In other words, it'll move with constant velocity. Kind of breaking that down into a little bit more verbose description, that means if it's already at rest, as in not moving, it's going to stay at rest. If it's already in motion, then it's going to continue in motion in a straight line with constant velocity. The big fancy physics word that we use to describe this idea is inertia. And that's a word that you might want to remember. Inertia is just a property of objects to resist changes in mass. We can quantify that by the inertial mass of the object. So a train has more inertia than a car because a train has more mass. And when I say that the forces on it are balanced, that just means that the vector sum is equal to zero. We can use the symbol sigma to represent sum, or net. And so kind of a shorthand way of writing balance would be to write that the sum of the forces equals zero. So some examples of constant velocity motion. Something like a hockey puck sliding on ice. In this class, ice is going to be considered frictionless. A person pushing a shopping cart, like if you're going grocery shopping. And then an airplane flying straight and level, which we do on a daily basis. When we want to understand what forces are acting on an object and how it's causing the object's motion to change, the first thing we're always going to do is draw what's called a free body diagram. If you want to abbreviate that FBD, You can, because scientists love acronyms. What a free body diagram does is it shows the forces acting on a given object. When we draw a free body diagram, we're not going to draw the actual object. We're just going to draw a box or a dot to represent the object. That's going to help us keep from getting confused. We're going to draw an arrow in the direction that the force acts, starting at the object's center of mass. We're going to point the arrow in the direction that the force acts, should make sense. And then we're going to draw the arrow to reflect the relative size of the force. A bigger force will draw a bigger arrow form. And then we're going to assign each arrow a label that's descriptive of what the force actually is. And we're going to work through some examples here today, and we'll look at some you know, real-life examples in class next time. So, here's a exa simple example. Suppose you have a sign hanging from a string. There's how you draw a sign when drawing a free body diagram. Um, signs are pulled down by the Earth's gravity, so we're going to draw a downward arrow, and we're going to label it FG, as in force of gravity. And then we're going to draw an upward a arrow, and we're going to label that T, T for tension. So strings and ropes and chains, we call the force exerted by them a tension force. Since I know the sign is, is hanging, I know the forces are balanced, so I should draw those two arrows to be about the same size best that I can. 
So let's do some more examples. Those three examples I listed earlier. Um, for a hockey puck, obviously it's got weight pulling it down. And then the ice would be pushing it up to keep it from plummeting straight to the center of the earth. Um, the FG again is the weight force caused by gravity pulling it down. FN would be the normal force, which is the fancy force due to a surface pushing something um, perpendicular to it. If we have a shopping cart, we would have the same two forces, but we also have U pushing it forward. The reason that you have to push a shopping cart forward is because friction is trying to slow it down. And so I'm going to draw an FP push arrow to the right, and then a friction arrow going to the left. I'm going to draw those smaller than the uh, weight of the cart because chances are they are smaller than the actual weight of the cart. You don't push a shopping cart with enough force to actually lift it. You just push it enough to keep it moving down the aisle while you look for the rice or whatever you're shopping for. If we do something similar for an airplane, airplane has weight going down. Um, instead of a normal force pushing it up, I would draw a FL for lift force. That's the force that an airplane's wing exerts due to the air moving underneath it. Um, if you've ever stuck your hand outside of a window while you're in a car moving fast down the highway, you notice that there's an appreciable force pushing your hand back. We call that force drag. And so on an airplane, because it's moving through the air really fast, there's going to be a big drag force pushing it to the left. That means there's got to be something pushing it forward, and we would refer to that as the thrust of the engines. So if it's moving at a constant velocity, then those two forces would have to balance each other, and so we would draw them the same size. Don't worry about understanding what all those different forces mean right now. That's what we're going to spend next class period doing. I do want you to note that all the arrows to the right on each of those pictures is balanced by an arrow to the left. So this is balanced by this. This is balanced by this. And then same thing for the up and downs. That's got to be true anytime something is moving at a constant velocity. The reason that we might want to draw a free body diagram, other than just to get a good picture, is we want to use that to now write a net force equation. And what that simply means is an equation that shows all the forces acting on an object and then adds them up as vectors. So remember that for a vector, the direction matters, meaning that if a force going to the right is positive, then a force going to the left would have to be negative. Usually we have to write one for both directions of motion, x direction and the y direction. And we keep those separate because they don't affect each other. And these are the equations that are going to be the starting point for analyzing the forces on an object. So most of what we do in physics for the first nine weeks or so uh, is going to start with a free body diagram. So for the cart, my net force equations would look like this. In the y direction, I had the normal force pushing up, gravity going down. So I'd write net force in the y direction equals normal force minus gravity. In the x direction, I have the push going to the right, friction going to the left, so I just write push minus friction, kind of sort of like that. Since we know that the force is a balance, we can say that the sum is zero. We could then use those to figure out um, any unknown forces in a given situation. So let's look at an example of how we do that. So here's a free body diagram that I've drawn. For something that's moving at a constant velocity, which anytime you read those words, you should immediately go, hey, that means the forces are balanced. To the right, which actually doesn't really matter. I don't care what direction it's moving. I just need to know that the forces are balanced. And there's five forces acting on it as shown. Write two net force equations and find the unknown force, F. So we want to figure out what this force is, given the other two horizontal forces. So the y direction would look something like that. Net force is the normal force minus gravity. In the x direction, I have one force going to the right, that's FP, and then two going to the left. So that's why I have two forces that have a negative sign in them. 
force push minus friction force minus the mysterious force F. And then because I know the forces are balanced, I can go ahead and set that equal to zero. That's kind of the key piece of knowledge that we need. And so since that equals zero, I can solve it for F. Always solve your equation symbolically first, like this, then substitute in the numbers. That prevents you from making easy mistakes and it makes your work easier to read. And then I can do 800 minus 500 and I get 300 newtons for that force F. And then we should be in the habit of always writing a vector with a direction. So before you finish this one off, write that the force is equal to 300 newtons to the left. Don't neglect the direction um, unless you're specifically told to. Let's look at another example. In this example, we've got four forces acting on it. Again, write two net force equations and find the unknown force F. In this situation, the object is at rest, which tells me the same thing, that the sum of the forces acting on the object are zero. Notice that the tension force is going both up and to the right, which means it has a X component and a Y component, and we need to resolve it into X and Y components. So I'm going to draw a separate vector diagram to find the X and Y components. I can use the cosine function to find Tx, so that's just 800 cosine 60, which will be 400 newtons. And then I can go ahead and write my net force equations. And the y direction is just normal force plus tension in the y direction. So that's that dude. And then minus gravity, since it's going downward. And I can go ahead and say that's equal to zero if I want to. And then in the x direction, I've got Tx going to the right, and then F, whatever that is, going to the left. And again, that equals zero, since the forces on it are balanced. So I can solve this for F, Just add F to both sides to get it by itself. And so F has to equal 400 newtons. And then go ahead and include the direction with it. So we need to be able to put all those pieces together. So here's kind of what we want to be able to do um, by the end of the next class period. Don't feel like you need to be an expert in this right now, but we're going to work on those first three next class. The other two things are things from our summer assignment. So if we're not good at those things yet, like if you don't see where I got cosine from in drawing that vector diagram, you might want to go back in review resolving vectors. Um, and if you don't see how I rearrange that equation to solve for F, you might go back and you know, review how to solve an equation. But we need to be able to identify the forces on an object, draw a free body diagram to scale, write a net force equation from that free body diagram, resolve any vectors that we need to, and then solve for whatever it is we want to find if we need to find something that is unknown. So, quite a large task. We're going to work on those first three things in class next time. I'll see you then. Until then, ta-ta.